I was 19 or 20 years old, uh, maybe 21, my best friend got killed in a car accident. And so I started thinking a lot about what was important in life. At the same time, the Intifada started. And I started seeing pictures in the newspaper of, uh, of guys my age who were going into battle. This whole Israel idea, something I hadn't really thought that much about before. And I started feeling like it was really important to me that, that I was connected to my people. I came to Israel with the idea of joining the army. I knew I wanted to go into a special unit, special forces of the paratroopers, that, is, that focuses on the Gaza area. Gaza is a very, very dangerous place to, to operate. Has a lot of people who are very, very violent and would want nothing more than to see a lot of dead Jews. We all knew that we're going into a place that the enemy wants us to come into. We knew that they had booby traps set for us. We knew that they were waiting for us with anti-tank rockets. Gaza is not a place you want to go. Hundreds of soldiers all around us and we're all getting ready to go inside and tanks driving by and, uh, and chaos. 15 minutes, be ready to move out. Have your gear on you, paint your face, everything, you're ready to go. There's this line of soldiers, like as far as you can see, walking toward the border of Gaza. You get up to a certain point and there's some, uh, some soldiers standing on either side of the road and they're asking each person who goes by, do you have your dog tags? I'm like, no, I don't have my dog tags. They write my name down, Ariel Siegelman equals number 6624. Put one in your boot, put one in your other boot, put one around your neck. Because you know what dog tags are for. I gotta have one in one boot, one in the other boot, and one around my neck because if they find pieces of my body somewhere and they don't know whose body it is, so now hopefully they'll be able to tell. Oh, that's number 6624. Then we get to a point right at the fence where they stop us and stand us in a big semicircle, in a chet. Many, many men deep. Huge semicircle because hundreds of soldiers, all of us with our faces painted, we're all standing there with all of our equipment on, all of our gear, everybody's brain is buzzing, like trying to figure out what the heck's going on. So they hand us this little card, this laminated card, that says, Tfilah Lifnei Yitziah Lekrav, the prayer for going out to battle. And there's this rabbi standing there in front of all of us, and he yells at the top of his lungs, and he says the psukim, right, like the statements in the Torah that the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, says to the nation before the nation goes off to battle. He says, you are the army of Israel, and you're going to war, but you will not be afraid, because God is going out to war with you. God is going to fight your battle for you. I think I speak for, uh, for the other guys who were there. All that buzzing, all that like confusion that was going on, it was just like, focus. We went into Gaza, and God went into Gaza with us. It was like walking into hell. The world is full of, of explosions. The world is full of smoke. I mean, it's, it was war. I would not have been surprised if there were dozens of, uh, of dead men. And I see a whole bunch of armored personnel carriers and tanks with their hatches open. And I think like, man, how many guys got it? And as I'm going by, I'm kind of glancing inside to look and look for the blood. So I see my officer and I ask him, uh, how many of us got hurt? How many people got killed? He said, uh, he said well, nobody. Nobody got killed. And I'm like, what? In all of that shooting, and all of those explosions, and all of that stuff that was going on around us, nobody got killed? One guy got injured. A 
chunk of concrete comes flying out of the house and, and hits this guy, tears the arm of his uniform, and when I saw the medic taking care of him, he was using a baby wipe. That was the injury in our unit in the Gaza War. When we walked out of Gaza, as the sun peeked up over the horizon, there was this huge double rainbow in the sky with military vehicles, tanks driving by, and there's this euphoric feeling of knowing that, you know, okay, so far, man, I survived. And for a moment, for, for a couple of minutes, everybody stopped. And all these guys are like looking at the sky. I'm telling you, people felt it. The whole time we were in there, we felt it like, what is going on? How come the bullets aren't hitting us? How come the explosions aren't getting us? How come the trip wires, we see them? Everyone, how come we find everything? It doesn't seem right. Something's not right here. This rainbow went across the sky. These guys were stopping. They reached their hands to the sky and they're like cheering. I hear guys saying, like, he's with us. Hashem Itano. We went into Gaza, and God went into Gaza with us.
In the summer of 2009, we traveled to Israel and studied the Israeli Defense Force. The IDF is a multifaceted defense force. Comprised of over 176,000 active personnel, the IDF has the 34th largest standing army. It has one of the strongest codes of conduct of any army in the world. In addition to protecting the land of Israel, the IDF takes on humanitarian projects, such as instigating the 1984 program to airlift thousands of Jews out of Ethiopia, or recently setting up a field hospital in Haiti to help earthquake victims. We wanted to investigate the media's portrayal of the IDF. What we found was in stark contrast to the media's depiction, and we became intrigued by this media bias. We are immoral people, the, um, and sometimes when when the media shows us some photographs or some movie movies that might seem very harsh and difficult, and we don't you don't understand what uh, what made them do those uh, those horrible actions that you might see, but sometimes uh, TV may be very deceptive. David then gave us an example of the lengths the army went to prevent unnecessary loss of life during the 2009 conflict in Gaza. In one of the first three days of fighting, we took a defensive position in some Palestinian houses. And one day there's this woman who approached our position. She looked like an educated middle-aged woman. She approached the house and she was yelled at in Arabic and also in Hebrew that she should stop. The same woman just kept coming towards the house and picked up her pace. We yelled at her again when she was just 50 meters away, which was already, according to our rules of engagement, closer than we were supposed to let her be. But because she was a woman, we just kept yelling, and the sergeant that spoke Arabic warned her, but it didn't help, so we shot into the air. When she came within range that endangered our soldiers, we shot at the ground near her feet, but that didn't stop her either. When she got to the point where it was a matter of endangering lives and we couldn't let her go any further, we shot her. Afterwards, when we checked her body, we found she was booby-trapped. It seems that her intention was to blow herself up in the house. Even at the point where we shot her, we're lucky she didn't set off the suicide bomb. With a common love for their homeland and a service requirement for over 80% of the country's citizens, IDF soldiers feel it is their duty to protect the state of Israel. אין לנו מדינה אחרת בתור יהודים, זאת המדינה היחידה שלנו ובשביל זה כולם חייבים להתגייס בשביל להגן על המדינה בצורה הכי טובה. Throughout our travels in Israel, we found soldiers who are committed to protecting their homeland. They were nothing like the stereotypical soldiers reflected by the media, as they told us again and again of their love for their country and the steps they take to be a professional and humane army. We do it for our, also our own sake, but we're also saving ourselves. We're not, we're not killing anybody for no reason or just because we have a gun and they don't. We're doing it because we're more people and we're saving ourselves and we're taking care of, our, taking care of ourselves because we want to survive. This is our, our country and we have to take care of it. And this is the only place that we have got. In the end, what we found was in stark contrast to the media's depiction. We were proud of the sacrifices, the morality, and the compassion we saw in the Israeli soldiers we met. We could not forget that these soldiers were just a few months older than we were, yet their teenage years will be marked by something none of us have experienced firsthand, hostility and war. Our encounter with the IDF soldiers was a life-altering experience for us. And I want to come make Aliyah. Enjoy the army.
My name is Daniel Hay. I'm born and raised from England, London. I'm now serving in the paratroopers unit in uh, Battalion 890. My name is Zina Milstein. I'm 19 years old. I was born and raised in New York. I now live in Israel and I serve as a sniper instructor in the IDF. Away from family and friend, away from the comforts of home life, these two young soldiers are making their dream come true, their lifelong dream of serving in the IDF. My battalion 890 right now is on the border between the Gaza Strip and the Israeli settlements uh, and uh, our job is just to make sure that no terrorists try to come uh, through the borders and uh, we keep uh, Israel safe. Here on base I'm a sniper instructor, uh, I train soldiers when we're done, um, they go into Gaza uh, and they go on missions and operations. Zina and Danielle both remember how they felt when they decided to pack their stuff and make Aliyah. After high school I decided I was going to spend a year of volunteering in Israel just to find out and see what exactly Israel is and what I've uh, been missing all my life. My year of volunteering was, uh, consisted of nine months and I volunteered in different places throughout Israel and I fell in love with Israel really instantly and within just the first few months in Israel I already knew this was my home, my new home and I decided I was going to make Aliyah after my year of volunteering and uh, leave my friends and family and just join the army and, and start my new life in Israel. Uh, Israel's always been a really big part of my life. Ever since I was three years old, every summer my mother, brother and I used to come to Israel and spend two months of the summer. When I was 16 years old, I went on a summer trip in Israel. Uh, they took us to a coexistence museum. This museum was, had an album about, uh, with pictures of all the fallen soldiers fighting terrorism. My counselor, who was only two years older than me, opened the book and on the first page, uh, she saw three friends of hers that had died. At that moment, I knew, that's it. I have to come here and I have to make Aliyah. Why them and not me? Why should they sit on the borders and guard my home. This is my home and this is the home of every Jew. Uh, I called my parents up one day in London from Israel and I told them, uh, Mom, Dad, uh, I think I've got a new home. So the second I got back from Israel, I said, that's it, I'm going to the army, I'm going to make Aliyah. And everyone was kind of like, yeah, 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 we'll see, uh-huh. And then it finally got to, you know, the end of my senior year when I said, all right, let's go buy this ticket, let's go, let's do it. And everyone was kind of like, wait a minute, wait a minute, <laughs> you're really going? And that was that. Neither Danielle nor Zina had any hesitation when deciding how they could best maximize their service in the IDF. Uh, the reason that I decided to have a more combat job instead of be a secretary or work at a desk in you know, intelligence or wherever uh, was because I really wanted to feel like I was in the army and you know I didn't leave my entire life behind to sit and make coffees for somebody so I decided do it with all our muscles and all our might. I wanted to make the most. I wanted to get as far as I could and, uh, and even though it really is difficult and it's really hard to be in a paratroopers unit and all the training that we went through, the eight months of training including the jumping off planes, it was a really amazing experience and it was really difficult but I'm really happy I did it and the reason why I chose to do it is because uh, I just wanted to, I really felt like I could uh, make the most out of myself and get as far as I could. I have no doubt in my mind that everything I did, I would do it over again a million times. This was the best decision I've ever made in my entire life. This has made me a completely different person. It's made me independent, it's made me strong, it's made me responsible. I don't regret making Aliyah. I don't regret joining the army. I'm really happy where I am right now. I'm happy that I'm serving the country. I'm happy that I'm in Israel. And I'm happy that I have a new life in Israel. Both of these brave young people strongly believe that Israel is a place for all Jews and that they must serve to protect her. Israel for me is a, a place of opportunity, the new future for the Jewish people uh, and just the future for every Israeli and every Jewish person around the world. If there is one Jew in the world, one Jew being persecuted for his religion, then there has to be a home. There has to be home. History is, repeats itself. The Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, the Holocaust. It comes a time, yes, man, <laughs> that we have our own country and we have to protect it.
but it's really hard to be a lone soldier in the army, but uh, the friends of the IDF have made a really unbelievable uh, experience for a lone soldier in the army. I've gotten a letter from the States saying we support you and we're proud of you, and, and that makes all the difference, and it makes you feel so good that you really don't feel alone, even though there are moments where you do feel alone. It's, I mean, sometimes they send us uh, to lone soldiers a present, you get a pillow or something, or a backpack. The little things that make your life just a bit easier and just put the smile on your face. It makes you feel good that you know that there's somebody thinking about you back in America and that's proud of you and supports you in what you do. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Corporal Zina Milstein and Corporal Daniel Chai of the Israel Defense Forces. If you miss me
Native-born Israeli Jews are required to serve in the Israeli Defense Forces and make up the vast majority of the IDF. But who are the rest? What makes foreign Jews and non-Jewish natives to Israel want to sacrifice so much time and energy and in some cases risk their own lives? We have Israel. It's a pretty amazing and special country. And unfortunately, it needs an army in order to survive. So if I want Israel to continue existing for future generations, I have to do my part to help defend it. We are kind of a light in the Middle East. We are a very unique democratic country in this area. We are 5.5 million Jews surrounded by 600 million Muslims. Most of them hate the West. I've always wanted to defend this country. It's my, it, it's my country. I feel more connected here than I ever did in America. And I came here to grow as a person, and I came here to defend the Jewish people. Even though Israel is a Jewish country, not only Jews serve in the IDF. When I was in different positions in the IDF, I had the opportunity to serve with both Druze officers enlisted, with Muslim, Bedouin, all sorts of different types. They're Israeli-born, they live in Israel, they're citizens in Israel, and they proudly serve their country. Like Jews, members of one Arab community in Israel, known as the Druze, are also required to serve. The Druze are non-Muslim Arabs who follow a religion of their own. I feel like really uh, proud of this to go to the army and uh, do my duty and because I live here I'm a, I'm a citizen, I'm an Israeli and, and I think it's too important for me to serve my country because I have no other country to go and to live in. And the Druze in general you'd have to do a whole film to explain how committed they are and how much they both serve our country and they do their positions in the most magnificent way. <laughs> بين لوحيم دروزي ولوحيم يهودي كلهم متقدمين بسلامة درجات كتسين دروزي جاء لدرجات ألوف أيوم مش نام شيشة دروزي تتي ألوفيم بنهم تات ألوف شي مش مش مسكير صفائي شن السيام دينا مارشي مون بيرس A different Arab community in Israel, the Bedouins, are not required to serve in the IDF, yet some do. The Bedouins are a nomadic tribal community of Muslims. בדואים מבינים את הצבא ומתנדבים בשביל המדינה, להגן על הכל במדינה. זה האהבה שלנו במדינה ובצבא. The Bedouin community in Israel, there are certain tribes that all volunteer into the military. אני בעד שהילדים שלי ישרתו בצבא, אני חלק מעמדת ישראל. אני תושב שאני כמו כל תושב ישראלי. מאוד אני מרגיש כקרבה למדינה. אם זה אינתיפאדה או לא אינתיפאדה, זה אותו דבר. כמו שאין אינתיפאדה, אני מאגן על המדינה שלי. גם באינתיפאדה אני מאגן על המדינה שלי, זה אצלי אותו דבר. the Druze, I've been with Bedouins, uh, Jews from Ethiopia, Christians from Russia, people from all over Europe, South America, everywhere. It's really, really interesting to be immersed and work together with people who you've never really been with before. To serve an army like that, you feel really that you are part of the nation. I learned a great deal about Israeli society, everything from kibbutz life to, uh, to religious Judaism, the secular left to the far religious right, all walks of life throughout uh, Israeli society, both the Jewish and non-Jewish. And each person has a story to tell, each person has a perspective, and it's been uh, absolutely amazing. I have more in common with Druze and Bedouin military men than I do with a lot of the people in the state of Israel. <laughs> Everyone has the same, the same uniform, everyone has the same rules, and everyone has the same rights. We're all here. We all still do our service. I don't really care if someone's Jewish or not Jewish. If you're in the army, you're still a soldier, and you're still expected to do the same job as everyone else.
Millions of personal connections are what make Israel a special place. Although protecting Israel is not always an easy task, it is one that people from all walks of life feel compelled to do. If I was going to convince somebody back home to join the army uh, here in Israel, I would say that it is an amazing and rewarding experience and it will help you grow as a person. I learned things about myself that I couldn't, that I couldn't do before. I've changed as a person, I've matured and couldn't be happier. To serve in the army, it's a very, very unique opportunity that you can be a part of something much, much, much bigger than you. Uh, there are a lot of times when you think it might not have been the right decision, but after, uh, after the, at the end of the day, when you're looking back at it, I couldn't have imagined making another decision or being happier with uh, how my life has turned out. שלושה חיילי צה"ל מחטיבת גבעתי נהרגו וארבעה נפצעו בהיתקלות שהייתה אמש עם חוליית מחבלים. המחבלים היו בדרכם לבצע פיגוע מיקוח בישראל. ההרוגים הם סרן רונן ישי וייסמן ממושב מסלול בנגב, סגן אלכסנדר זינגר מקיבוץ עין צורים בשפלה. כוח צה"ל שסרק אתמול לפנות ערב באחת הגבעות הנידחות הללו נתקל במלכודת מוות. מחבלים המתינו לכוח עד שהגיע בשלמותו למקום. המפגש בין המחבלים לבין כוח צה"ל התנהל מטווחים קצרים ולאורך זמן רב. בכרוזים שנשאו איתם המחבלים הפרו-סוריים הם מדברים על מלחמה בישות הציונית הכובשת בדרום לבנון. Alex was born near New York City on September 15th, 1962. His one-year older brother is Saul, and his two younger brothers are Daniel and Benji. In 1973, the family went to Israel, intending to stay for only one year, but remaining for four. During that time, Alex became a bar mitzvah at the Western Wall. He attended schools in Jerusalem. In the last year, together with Saul, he lived at Kibbutz Kisufim. In 1977, the whole family returned to the Washington, D.C. area. In 1980, Alex entered Cornell University, where he put together a program in Jewish and Russian studies. And during two of his summers, attending the Brandeis Bardeen Collegiate Institute in California, he discovered how well Judaism expressed his idealism. While studying at the London School of Economics in 1982-83, Alex traveled in Europe, following the trail of Jewish history. He was enchanted with Spain, its glorious past and present landscapes. He made a short trip to the Soviet Union to meet Jewish refuseniks, those brave Jews whose request to leave for Israel had been denied by the Soviets, causing them to live in poverty and anxiety. Alex made Aliyah on the last day of 1984 and was drafted into the Israeli army six weeks later, where he volunteered for the paratroops and later became an officer.
Dear Benj, happy birthday. If you decide to make something new, the key is to make your activity something that you are not doing for yourself, to find something that you can do for others. This sounds very, very odd, but it is true. Sorry for preaching, but I don't want you to kick yourself when you're 21, like I am kicking myself for having wasted so much time when I was younger on myself. Love, Alex. February 3rd, 1985. Dear Mom and Dad, Just got off the phone with you just to show you that talking doesn't make me less likely to write. It's Monday now. I'll be a soldier in seven hours. I'm not worried, so you shouldn't. Dear soul, Today is Sunday. The Shabbat, which ended yesterday evening, was the first I've spent on an Orthodox kibbutz. You have to be here for one before you can appreciate the beauty of a community of hundreds of people working together for six days and then resting together and making the seventh holy rather than merely workless. April 1st, 1985. Dear Daniel, now things are less rosy and I'm not grinning. My body is deteriorating again. But more than the physical problems are the problems I have when I have too much time to think. I tell myself that I'm in the wrong place, that I will never feel part of my platoon, that I can't picture anyone in my platoon as a good friend, that I don't want to serve in the paratroop battalion, etc., etc. A lot of the indecision comes from the fact that my presence in the army is voluntary, unlike that of the sober soldiers. This means that I spend time thinking whether I made the right choice. Stupid thing to do, but I did it anyway. Every letter from Dad and Saul is painful, as well as happy for me, because both write of things which I miss doing, and I know I could do well. Love, Alex. April 4th, 1985. Sanur. Dear family. Today we leave the dream world of the training camp and return to the real army of little sleep and many lineups. The morning sun came up and lit the hills here at Sonor beautifully. I wish you could see this place. I even had a chance to do a couple of sketches. April 17th, 1985. Dear Grandma Jean. The army is hard on me, but I think it will get better. The hills right around the base are sensual with their curves and crevices, and everything should move at a pace which is closer sync with the hills. But whenever we enter the hills, we move like Marines and snort and pant and sweat when we should be lying under an olive tree, drawing and sleeping. Oh well. May 6, 1985, Beit Dear Mom and Dad, Today has been one of the hardest days of basic so far. The pain, which is as great as loneliness, comes from fear, pure fear. I fear failure and I fear physical challenges. My lack of fitness makes this fear worse because I know it will make the trials ahead more painful. Remember, this letter was written two weeks before you read it, so by now, the problems it discusses are all in the past and all is well. Lead, June 14th, 1985. Dearest Mother, Happy Birthday. As I sit in the Beit Lead Army store waiting to go back to the Army for Shabbat, I'm thinking of you. And tears are welling up a bit in my eyes because when I spend time thinking about you, I miss you. And now that it's your 50th birthday, how can I but think of you? I think gratitude but I won't begin to list the reasons for my gratitude because the list would be endless. I admire the way you've taken your children for what each of them is and added to each of them. You take the world so well and that makes me happy. Now I must go. I wish I could have been with you to 120. Love, Alex. July 2nd, 1985. Telnov. It's late morning now. I've already jumped twice. Stepping out of an airplane at 1,200 feet is like nothing else in the world. 
It is preceded by fear, which must accompany doing anything as ridiculous as stepping out of a secure place into emptiness. Once the fear passes, the jump is so much more pleasant than what I've thought. The second you're in the air, you want to shout and sing. So, I did. Basic training ended Wednesday morning at around 11.30 when we received our Red Berets. The Western Wall was the end point of the 55-mile Masakunta. The views were a joy as they always are as one enters Jerusalem. But on foot, in moonlight, through valleys of pine, the entrance is specially special and moving. November 29th, 1985, Lebanese border, dear Catherine. I'm not stationed in Lebanon, but at times we have to go in. You must never forget that my being where I am is not a result of my world view, but of the fact that if we weren't here, Israel would live in terror. And because we are here, and what we do, even the settlements on the border, are quiet. When I guard at sunrise, and the snow-capped Hermon turns to pink, and the sky to every shade of purple, and the Moezin calls the faithful to prayer in the village below, and I'm warm because the heater is working, and I'm singing to myself because beauty makes me want to sing. Then the moment takes me away from the trials of the army, and I am at peace, and I know you would like to see it. Ides of March, 1986, dear Saul, your Africa letter reminded me of my feeling last week in Shechem and earlier in Lebanon when I found out that our interrogation methods are more brutal than I would admit to journalists. The reason for unfairness must never be forgotten by those being unfair or they get carried away. I wish you were here. I have lots of things troubling me which I'd like to talk out with you. I feel very much alone tonight. I need to find a girlfriend who is incredibly beautiful and sexy and doesn't spend too much time thinking of how to please me. Right. Love, Alex. June 1st, 1986, Officer's School, Dear Family. In just one month, I was supposed to be getting out of the Army. But I'm here in the middle of nowhere. Only this nowhere belongs to the IDF Officer's School. As it becomes quickly too dark to write, I enjoy the calm of the falling darkness. The calm of the silence, but for the wind. The calm of knowing a hard day is behind me, and I can rest. August 17th, 1986. Once in a while, as I progress toward the course's end, I feel a pang of fear. Today I felt such fear. If the war comes, when the war comes, I will have to lead men to die. But those men were not men a short time ago. Some don't even shave yet. And I will have to have the calm power to yell to them or to whisper Kadima. And I will have to have the calm power to step forward myself. December 20th, 1986. Dear Catherine, there are many things about this country which I truly hate. There's a long list. But because I see the place as my home, I don't pile the cons on one side of the scale and the pros on the other and come to a conclusion whether it was worth staying here. This country is my home emotionally, religiously, and in any other way except the location of my family. Home is home, and it will take more than irritations to force me to leave. I want to make this place better. Love, Alex. August 16th, 1987. The tents of the encampment were folded up and sent to brigade headquarters. And in general, the battalion prepares itself for the next two to three months. Kav. Today, the officers and sergeants are going up, and Tuesday, the soldiers will join. Last letter, unfinished. September 13th, 1987. Dear Harold. The day after tomorrow, I'll be 25. This is a good age, the prime of life. It is once again a time of decision for me. I've decided I would like to be a company commander. So I don't feel like I'm aging. The fact that I'll finish my next position at age 26 or 27 is not worrisome. 
I'm pleased that... Serving as a Givati platoon commander, Alex was killed on Hardov in the security zone of Lebanon on his 25th birthday, September 15th, 1987. Dear Alex, you have left us so much of yourself, so many drawings, so many writings that make us smile and think about life, yours and ours. We can hear your laughter, feel your joy, and we are powered by your message to do. Do as you believe and people will follow you. Do what is right because only then will you have the power to affect the world. We and Saul, Daniel and Benji, together now in Israel, are all trying to make you proud of how we build our lives. Love, Mom and Dad.
Ugandan forces prove no match for the elite Israeli commandos. Ugandan guards fire bursts from the control tower, and Yoni's unit advances on them. Suddenly, Yoni collapses, hit by a sniper. I report to Yoni that the mission was carried out, but before he answers, Amir comes on the communication line and shouts, Muki, Yoni's hit, Yoni's hit. Still under attack from the tower, the soldiers form a protective corridor for the hostages. Heads of families ensure that all are accounted for. Incredibly, just three hostages were killed in the rescue. Among the assault force, there is but one fatality. Yoni Netanyahu. Two hours before dawn, the last Israeli plane lifts off from Nairobi. The only evidence of their visit is bloodstains on the tarmac. At 3 a.m., the BBC transmits reports of the rescue to a stunned world. Every person in Israel will always remember where they were when they heard the news. Future Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had no doubt that his older brother Yoni helped lead the mission. I learned that Israel had acted in Antibes and at that point I picked up the phone. I called my younger brother Ido and I said, uh, I had only one question and these are the words that I said. I said, hi, is Yoni back? Joyous Israelis take to the streets, waving wildly to the planes passing overhead. A tumultuous crowd gathers at Lod Airport to welcome home the returning heroes. At 11 a.m., the first C-130 touches down. It's been six days and 22 hours since the hijacking ordeal began. The passengers of Flight 139 are finally safely home, and all of Israel rejoices. Anxious relatives and friends rush out to meet the hostages and their liberators. of the hostages is tempered by the expression of the men who had saved their lives. We asked the soldiers, why do you look sad? We told them, uh, you've done one of the most heroic deeds in uh, military history, which will probably be studied in uh, military academies for uh, many, many years. And they said, yes, but our uh, leader was killed. United in joy and sorrow, Israelis joined hands to mourn the loss of Yoni Netanyahu. In his honor, the mission would later be renamed Mivitsa Yehonatan, Operation Jonathan. I had lost a, a beloved brother. This was a great shock and uh, undoubtedly affected my life in fundamental ways. A few hundred brave soldiers helped change history. But even more important to them, they saved the lives of over 100 men, women, and children. Janet Almog and her fellow hostages will be forever grateful to their saviors. So wonderful to be home. I really did not expect to get home all in one piece. I don't think there are any words in the world to describe what your feelings are at that point of realizing that you might got a second lease on life, literally. Um, and the thousands of people that met us at the airport and, and the relief. It's just incredible relief. You don't realize how much emotion you've stored up. And we just cried and cried and sort of let it all out then. I don't take anything for granted. Anything. Every day is a joy. 
While the world stood mute and paralyzed, one tiny nation had defeated the forces of evil. The day was July 4, 1976. In the United States, Americans celebrated 200 years of liberty. Half a world away, the passengers of Flight 139 celebrated their own emancipation. Freedom had won the day.
He was always very funny and he was always full of pranks and he was always being silly. But on the other end of the spectrum, with, when it had to do with the security of Israel and all that stuff, he was so serious. But that's, I guess that's, that's Mike. That was, you know, it was the wool hat and the baseball and the hockey. Shalom. Shalom um, but Israel was always there. I've really just never seen somebody just thrive and, and, and just love Israel like he did. He had such a passion for it and, and no matter what was going on here, he, he, he had nothing bad to say about Israel, which was just amazing because it's very hard to be a, a new immigrant here by yourself and to deal with Israeli bureaucracy and everyone complains and, and there's nothing, what are you going to do, that's how it is. But, but Mikey, no matter what, he, he had that characteristic smile on his face and he'd say, well, you know, this and this happened, but but I'm loving it here. The last thing Michael said to us, he says, don't worry about me. He says, I'm going to exactly where I want to go. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. So Michael went into this with open eyes, as I'm sure all those other Israeli soldiers did too. It's the price we pay for defending. When the Second Lebanon War broke out, Michael was here on vacation at his parents' house. Without hesitation, he returned to Israel to his unit, but found out to his disappointment that his commanders decided not to let him go into Lebanon with the rest of his comrades. He says, I didn't come back here to go to Hebron. And Michael was very, very determined. And by the end of the day, he was able to convince his superiors before entering Lebanon, Michael called his sisters for the last time. You know, just in case something happens, I just want to say I love you. And I said, yeah, things going to be fine. What are you talking about? I'll talk to you later. He's like, I love you. I'll talk to you later. And that was it. It was like a 60-second conversation. He said to me, just saying he was going into Lebanon and to know that if anything happens to him, he will always be with me. And then he said, I'll talk to you later. But obviously, I never did talk to him later. It's a dream come true. Something I've wondered since I was a little kid. It's just, it's something no words could describe what it means. Michael's desire to defend the land of Israel. My father was a decorated combat veteran of the Second World War, and Michael was named after him. Uh, Michael's Hebrew name was Melech, which means king in Hebrew. In high school, Michael went to Israel with several of his friends from Council Rock High School. And I really think that that was the changing point for Michael. He was in love with the land. He was in love with the people. I remember the first day he came to me and said, but I must tell you, after the year of Nativ, I'm going to join the Israeli army. For someone to come at the first day of the program and to like declare and say it's make a statement, I'm coming back to Israel to serve in the Israeli army, was really an exceptional thing. My papers are done, I'm making Aliyah to Israel, I'm leaving. He had been waiting weeks, even months, for his admission papers, which never came. So he decided to take matters into his own hands, went down to the admissions building, tried to gain entrance through the front door, he was stopped by two armed guards, said to him, papers, he said, I had no papers, that's why I'm here. So he walked around the back of the building, he looked up at the second floor and saw a window open about three or four inches. So, being at the back of the building, he found a dumpster that he pushed across the way against the building. He climbed on the dumpster, climbed up the bars of the first floor window, pushed the window open, tumbled into the men's room on the second floor of the building, found the appropriate office, walked in. The man says, next. Michael sits down. He says, papers. Michael says, I don't have any papers. He says, son, you can't get through the front door of this building unless you have papers. Michael said, what makes you think I came through the front door? And he told him the story of how he got in. And the man said to him, you know, I've been here about 20 years. You're the first person to actually break into this building to get into the army. He says, sit down, we'll fill out your papers. It's a dream come true, something I've wondered since I was a little kid. It's just, it's something no words could describe what it means to me. It's a good one. I saw him training.
I know. You're working very, very hard. And I'm... Mario I'm, just took his keep off his head and he said, here, take mine. Put it on, such my throw. He looked at me and said, all right, you ready now? I said, yeah, I'm ready. Let me give it back to him. Put it on his head. before he went to the army. He called to me sometime in Yom Shishi, and I said, hello, I'm Michael Levin, and people say that if I want to go to the army, you are the man. Listen, Mike, I don't know you. To put your name, I have to meet you. I spoke with all the young kids in the Ulpan who came to learn Hebrew, and I met a young fellow, very small one, with a kippah on his head, and all the time, he's smiling, he's smiling, he's smiling. Mike, what is smile all the time? I don't know, but put me in a parachute unit. I'm smiling, but I'm, I'm strong. Don't go. Mike, go to eat some chicken, some cheese, bread. Be fed a little bit. It's okay. I'm That's the truth, man. No pain, no game. You don't take the pain, you're not going to go into the... A dream come true. Something I've wondered since I was a little kid. It's just, it's something no words could describe what it means to me. He's a good one. I saw him training. I know. You're working very, very hard, and I'm, I'm proud of him. Michael became very close friends.